Um, just for the people who think these links are very long, they actually are kind of long. Uh, so the easiest way to get to them is actually just to go through github.com slash nannyml, and then you will find that we have an examples repository, and there you should be able to find everything, both the webinars and the uh, uh, the presentation and all of the example cases uh, that we've prepared. We'll not do all of them, but uh, you can like browse them at your own leisure. All right, so let's uh, let's go on with the presentation then. Uh, I promise I won't be doing too much presentation. Uh, there's also code for those who want it. God knows that I want it, so that's nice. Okay, so uh, let's first start off by quickly introducing myself. Um, so my name is Niels, I live in Belgium. Uh, I've been working as a consultant uh, for about a decade uh, in like software engineering, data engineering and DevOps. Uh, I then joined NannyML in April 2021. Uh, and I'm currently the lead engineer. Uh, and that's also mainly due to like there not being any other engineers. So by default, I am the lead engineer for just a short time. Uh, and um, in that capacity, I'm responsible for uh, everything like architecture related, uh, also the implementation of the library and all of the supporting tools that we currently use uh, in NannyML itself. And we've got some exciting stuff coming along next as well. Uh, then about NannyML. Uh, so yeah, NannyML, we're definitely a company. Um, so we were founded by uh, our three founders, Hakim, Wojtek and William in 2020. Um, Basically, they started off uh, as consultants, so they had their own consulting firm doing um, data science and AI projects. And um, from their experiences there, the idea grew to build a product. Uh, they pitched for a couple of VCs, got funded, and then we quickly started growing the team with some researchers, uh, some data scientists, operations people, and growth uh, team. And um, we were uh, able to release uh, NannyML. That's not earlier this year, but like last year already, uh, come to think of it. Um, and yeah, we um, like one of our main goals is basically making the world a better place. Very corny, but it is what we do. All right, so what is this magical NannyML library then? So it's a library that um, has been built uh, with the purpose of assisting you in monitoring your machine learning models in production. And this production setting has a couple of like very specific issues that need to be resolved. And that's what we try to uh, assist with. So the functionality of the NannyML library is basically helping you calculate what the realized performance is for your model if you have target data available, targets ground truth, I'll just be using the terminology of target here, but it's synonymous with uh, ground truth. Um, now, if the target data is not available, and that's a new one, uh, which might occur quite a lot in production settings, we will help you to estimate the performance um, in case of missing target data. We can also do um, multivariate drift detection, and we have a very specific algorithm uh, that we've uh, that we've built for that one using uh, data reconstruction uh, using PCA. And we can also detect univariate drift using a whole load of um, different methods. And um, one of our colleagues, um, Carter, actually wrote uh, an amazing uh, summary on when to use which metric. Uh, for detecting univariate drift because they all have like their uh, areas where they shine and the areas where they are not really uh, applicable. So very interesting read uh, and you can find that uh, in our uh, documentation page. Um, next up, uh, it's not yet well known, but there is actually some cool stuff concerning um, calculating the correlation between the changes in uh, performance and the drift that is occurring in each uh, feature. And that basically allows you to rank the features uh, based on the importance that they might have in the changes that we're seeing in uh, model performance. Um, this is uh, called the ranker uh, functionality. It's something like it's still like early days for us uh, building this kind of thing. Um, 
but we're looking forward to getting some feedback uh, on how it works. Um, currently, NanyML is uh, supporting classification and regression use cases. And um, unfortunately, we currently only do it on tabular data, although we have been running some tests uh, internally as well. And we have been working hard on uh, supporting NLP cases as well as um, uh, working with images. And the results are promising for now. Uh, and we also include some plotting functionality. Um, and of course, uh, from the engineering parts, we also uh, try to integrate within the uh, existing cloud ecosystems uh, as much as we can. And for example, one uh, case that we do is we allow you to use cloud storage for both inputs, outputs, etc. cetera, uh, of the library. All right, uh, so a couple of things then are really short that we feel like make us a bit different than uh, the other monitoring solutions that there are out there. Um, we have this kind of philosophy where we feel performance is actually like the kind of golden metric that should be monitored. Um, and there's a, like a very important reason for that. Um, a lot of um, other libraries um, look very hard at things like uh, univariate uh, covariate shift, for example. Um, but we found that that is, you know, kind of fickle. Um, it leads to a lot of um, it leads to a lot of uh, alerts when there is actually no impact on the performance and basically we turn this whole thing around and we uh, choose to look at performance first and then basically make our way down uh, all the way to the level of like what is causing this performance drop could this be related to, for example, multivariate drift? Could it be related to concept drift? Could it be related to univariate drift? And we are basically, the philosophy is that NanyML should try to assist you in determining what the root cause of this performance change might be and uh, assist you in drilling down to the actual like feature level uh, incidents that are occurring. Uh, and a second thing that um, makes us kind of unique is the um, the addition of having performance estimation without ground truth. Uh, I won't go into like too many details here. Um, feel free to ask questions afterwards, although I might not be able to answer them. Um, and that's basically um, covering the two different methods that we have for estimating performance. We have one that works for classification. It's called confidence-based performance estimation. Uh, and it's basically boiling down to uh, estimating uh, what your confusion matrix is going to look like. And for, based on that, you can then just generate all kinds of metrics. Uh, and the other case uh, is meant for regression use cases. Um, the algorithm is called direct loss estimation. Uh, and it is basically training a model to predict the loss uh, over uh, your predictions. Uh, again, like we have lots of documentation written about all of those and all of the theoretical stuff that goes behind it. Uh, and you can find these within the uh, how it works uh, section of the documentation. Definitely worth the read if you're interested. All right. Now then. Uh, like as a kind of introduction to uh, the topic for today, Let's talk about like the ways that you can actually run NADML. There's two ways that we uh, uh, have in mind. And one is called the exploration mode, indicated by Dora the Explorer. Uh, and we have another one called the production mode, which is uh, Bob the Builder Robot. Uh, and these two cases uh, are actually kind of like very different from each other. So in the first case, the exploration mode, we see people using NannyML as a library in kind of an interactive setting. So you can use NannyML uh, within a like Jupyter notebook and you use it as a library. Um, the way that you use it is like very ad hoc. You run it once or maybe with like very low frequency, you repeat it like every three months or something, you load in, a very big data set uh, that contains like all of your model inputs and outputs for the last couple of months. You analyze them, you take a look, you take some actions. And basically the result is you get a time series of metrics, metric values. 
uh, all different kinds of them, right? Now, this is kind of opposed to the production modes and uh, the exploration modes, uh, come to think of it, my colleague William uh, actually did a webinar on that kind of scenario last week. Um, I think it's pretty soon going to be uh, live on YouTube, uh, the recording of it, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you can already find the uh, slides and I think the notebooks themselves as well in the examples repository. So uh, knock yourself out if you want to have a look at those. Um, anyway, apart from exploration modes, there's also the production mode. And this basically means that you are running NannyML in a far more automated way, right? So you run NannyML as either a CLI tool or a container, but basically automated. Um, you can fully configure it using configuration files. Um, and in that way, you can run NannyML in a repeated fashion uh, with a frequency as high as basically as the volume of your model inputs and outputs allows. Because of course, we still do a lot of statistical tests. So we want to have uh, a volume of data that is uh, large enough for the tests to be uh, statistically relevant. Um, so if you run this repeatedly, typically you're analyzing multiple data sets uh, during the day, for example. Uh, and they're typically going to be smaller than the exploration case, right? So in the exploration case, you're looking at a period of weeks, months, maybe even years. Whilst in a typical like production setting, of course, depending on the volume uh, of transactions that your model gets, um, you'll be looking at a time span of like a couple of hours, half a day, maybe, uh, all the way down to like a couple of days, maybe, or a week. Uh, and the end result is, again, actually quite the same. Um, it is, again, a time series of metric values, but opposed to the exploration case where we basically generate this entire time series all at once, so we calculate all of the data points all at once, in here, you're actually gradually building up this time series single point at a time, right? Uh, so as time passes on, you run NannyML in a repeated fashion, and every time a couple of uh, metric values come out, and you append all of these to different uh, time series. Now, these are actually two uh, different ways of running NannyML, and you could say even running NannyML in production, right? Because even this very like manual, low-level way of running things could be a valid way of actually doing uh, monitoring in production. It's not very automated, of course, but still, it can be valid. Um, and uh, a couple of uh, colleagues uh, or um, uh, a couple of um, people from a Belgian company called Radix um, applied the CMM, thus the capability uh, and maturity model. Uh, they applied this. Uh, this methodology to the field of MLOps, and they're basically trying to formalize the framework a little bit. And uh, one approach that they took is basically applying the five levels of CMM to the MLOps models. Uh, and the steps that they came up with are the standard ones, you know. So you have a manual process, a repeatable process, reproducible, automated, and a process that actually improves the rest of your. Uh, of your flow. And um, during a um, during a meetup earlier this year, we actually uh, went over all of these different levels and looked at how NannyML might apply to these uh, and in which fashion you could actually do monitoring using NannyML uh, for each of these maturity levels. And um, it's, of course, uh, quite logical to think that the higher you go in maturity, the bigger the investment will be and the bigger the, for example, the technology stack will be that you require in order to uh, fully uh, gain all of the advantages of that uh, maturity level. So uh, nearly there. So the first level is, um, as we discussed actually, so running NannyML in a notebook and you can see a screenshot here of doing that. Um, we basically just import NannyML 
as a pip package or using uh, Conda. We import it into uh, Jupyter, just run an EML uh, following the basic steps. So we create a calculator. We fit a calculator on something that we call reference data, which is basically a period in time that reflects how your model should behave. Uh, and we use that to kind of like train or calibrate our calculators. And then we use the uh, fitted calculator to uh, calculate, for example, in this case, uh, it is the univariate drift. So in here we have uh, the KS and Jensen-Shannon distance uh, that are being calculated for continuous methods and chi-square and Jensen-Shannon for categorical methods. You can see that you can also do some kind of plotting, etc. Uh, this is all like quite interactive. Um, so that means that most of the time, this is not meant for like a very uh, iterative, repeatable setup. Now, if you go to level two, you can easily make that more repeatable. If you, for example, just take it out of a notebook or you take the notebook and you just version the thing, right? It's versioned, you can share it. You can basically uh, have people just get clone it and repeat it. It's a very easy way of like gaining the maturity level, etc. The reason why I included it here is because it gives you a nice overview of what the code might actually look like. Uh, and we can like, quickly just cruise over it. Uh, so in the first uh, few parts, you can see that we're reading from uh, an S3 bucket. We're reading reference data and analysis data um, called reference data frame, analysis data frame. We define a couple of column names, and then we set up the, uh, the univariate drift calculator. You can see that we provide a couple of column names there. We indicate what the timestamp column uh, name is. This timestamp is then going to be used to uh, show um, uh, to, to visualize your information on a timeline, uh, which in most production settings makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then you can select which methods you would like to be using, continuous and categoricals. We just fit to the reference data, and then we can calculate the actual results. Um, and you can see as well here that these results can then be uh, saved to an, a, another S3 bucket, for example. And in this fashion, NaniML can basically become a part of the tool chain that you require um, for uh, monitoring your machine learning model. So basically, you have one process that makes sure that the model inputs and outputs get collected and get dumped in a fixed place. Um, NaniML can run in an automated fashion, or in this case, you can just run it by yourself in a, in a manual way. And you write out the results into a different location, and you use them as input for the rest of the chain. Now, I'm going to skip a couple of levels here, because to be honest, it's not very interesting, the in-between levels. The most interesting use case is, of course, the level five, where we can use um, the outcome of the monitoring process to actually drive results uh, and drive actions uh, within the rest of the tool chain again. So I'll quickly go over this, and then we can uh, hop into some actual code and examples. So the first steps that are always required are basically gathering the values for the model inputs and outputs. And like this is like a very important thing uh, that always needs to be done. This is the bread and butter of what NaniML actually needs to use. Um, so it's quite important to um, have those collected within your model. We are looking into ways of helping with that. Uh, and we were, for example, thinking of having some kind of logging functionality that you can use directly within, for example, something like fast API or whatever you use to actually host your models as an API. Um, this is like a well known um, a well known kind of solution that's also being used by uh, a couple of other um, uh, libraries within the same space as us. Uh, so, for example, what you might do here is if your model uh, uses, for example, FastAPI, uh, then you can combine FastAPI with the NaniML uh, future collection uh, uh, part of the library to enable you to collect the incoming feature values and the outgoing predictions of your model. 
and then we can store those for example using uh, dvc on git you can just like throw them on an s3 bucket whatever works works uh, the intent is to keep it quite lightweight here now as soon as we have collected this information uh, and we have uh, uh, suitable reference periods uh, of data available, then we can fit our calculators and estimators on the reference data, and we can store these calculators for later use. Uh, we've just developed this. Um, the functionality to do this is called the uh, store, NanyML store, uh, and basically it just uses a uh, file system, um, local or remote, so it could be S3 buckets as well, or just a local directory to store your fitted calculators in. Um, and upon running your uh, actual analysis part, it will uh, no longer fit uh, or refit your uh, calculators every time, but it will just use the ones that are uh, available in your own store. Uh, and that uh, should provide a significant uh, decrease in compute resources required to run your monitoring part. So we'll be using uh, stuff on the features store in order to actually fit them and the resulting fitted calculators can be stored in what is here on this diagram. Uh, this is a Google diagram, by the way, uh, can be stored within the metadata store. And then the last step is actually using these fitted calculators and estimators to produce the uh, performance metrics that are required. We can then store these metrics, uh, and we have multiple ways of doing that. Uh, I'll give an example of how to do it here. Uh, and then we can check for alerts and handle set alerts. And that could be, for example, creating an alert in Slack or pushing data to a webhook, etc. There's multiple ways of triggering uh, these things. Uh, and one way to set this up, and that's actually uh, the way that we're going to uh, look at right now, uh, is basically having NanyML uh, running the calculators and estimators. The results are going to be stored in a database. Um, I put time scale here because it fits very nicely with the use case. Although in the demos, I'm not going to use time scale for this uh, because of you know complexity. Um, and it makes sense to just use a regular Postgres instead. Time scale is basically Postgres with some extra additional stuff added on top of it. Um, and then we'll connect all of that to Grafana, which will allow us to visualize all of these results and also tap into the actual um, the actual functionalities that uh, Grafana offers us. Uh, for example, concerning um, visualization and um, actual alert handling. All right. So the demo that I'm going to show you, I'm actually going to show you two use cases. Uh, one's a simple one um, that's just going to take a static uh, big pile of data, process it, and then uh, export it to a database and um, show the results within Grafana. And that's like an intro case. Uh, and then we'll look at a more advanced scenario where we actually look at how you would actually put this into a uh, production setting because we will parameterize a couple of the settings uh, so that we can just deploy this, uh, deploy NanyML once. Uh, and have it run on a uh, on a certain schedule to basically uh, repeat this process day by day and deliver you these uh, time series that are continuously building up. So what does the demo setup look like? Uh, we'll be running NannyML as a container. Um, NannyML can be just uh, it's it's on um, it's on the Docker Hub, so you can uh, easily find that there uh, and use it. Um, and what we're going to do is we'll run NannyML. We will mount a couple of directories on it. Uh, that should make sure that we can have access to the data that we have prepared. Um, we will also uh, mount a store location here. Um, and that's basically going to make sure that we have the um, pre-fitted calculators available for our uh, repeat runs. The um, NannyML container is going to run, crunch some numbers, and the results are going to be exported to Postgres. And um, we'll connect Grafana to that one as well. Uh, and we can then visualize uh, all of our stuff within Grafana. And that's basically the scope of the demo that I'm going to show you. 
if you're following along uh, with the examples uh, on GitHub as well, uh, I think the first one we're going to take a peek at is the multi-class classification one. Uh, and let me quickly share another window now. Uh, I have a terminal open here. All right. So I hope everything is good and legible. Uh, but if you take a quick peek at what you can see within uh, this directory, so we're now in the multi-class classification directory, you can see a couple of different things here. Um, there's a readme file, uh, which is a quite verbose uh, description of everything that uh, I'm basically going to tell you here with lots of commands that you can execute yourself and uh, have a tryout. Um, there's a lot of things here that are due to uh, provisioning stuff. So we're running everything as Docker containers um, and we're orchestrating them using the lightweight Docker Compose way. Um, we are provisioning a database uh, and in order to do so, uh, you can see that we have a uh, data definition script here. So within our database, we are going to create a uh, an NMLUSER user and create an, an additional database uh, that will allow us to store our information there. We are also uh, provisioning Nanium, um, provisioning Grafana, I mean. Uh, and um, for those interested, you can actually uh, provision quite a lot of Grafana stuff, uh, including some dashboards and data sources. And uh, maybe it makes sense to take a quick peek at the data sources. So if you take a look here, then you can see that we are uh, defining a single data source called NanyML. It's a Postgres database. The URL here is actually an internal container URL because we're running within uh, Docker Compose. So the URL here or the database host is called metric store. We're connecting as user NanyML using the passwords that we gave earlier. And that should allow us to uh, seamlessly connect to the uh, metrics database that we have configured. Uh, and then we come to the good stuff. So let's take a quick peek at uh, what the actual Docker Compose is looking like. You can tell that this is already a bit bigger. There's three big blocks here. We have a metrics store, we have Grafana. So this is basically the database. Um, we are mounting this, uh, SQL data definition scripts into it, into a fixed location that'll make sure that uh, the SQL script is executed upon uh, the container starts. Then we have Grafana in here. Um, you can see that we are controlling uh, the user creation here by providing a couple of environment variables and also by, again, doing the same trick. We are mounting a certain directory into a fixed location. Uh, hence, uh, Grafana knows to provision stuff for us. And then of course we come down to NannyML. You can see that in here, I'm waiting until both the metric store and Grafana uh, are up and running uh, because otherwise it gets a bit messy in the logs. Uh, so this is like more for oversight than anything else. Um, we are using NannyML version 0.8.2. Uh, this is the uh, Docker container name uh, or the image name that you uh, can just uh, pull from Docker Hub. Uh, and what we're going to do next is also mount a couple of things. So you can see in here that we are mounting something called uh, config uh, slash nannyml. Um, and this is basically the configuration file that uh, controls how nannyml will behave in production, right? So this allows us to fully configure nannyml. We are going to mount a data repository. And as I said earlier, like within the overview picture, we're gonna mount a couple of directories that allow us to basically see what is going on or uh, provide external uh, data to this container. Um, and the same thing for the store, of course. Uh, and as soon as we have started the uh, container, we're gonna uh, provide the commands that we're actually going to run, which is nannyml run. Uh, this is executed by default, uh, by the way, uh, through the container. And now um, there's one final piece uh, to the puzzle that we are 
left to check out. And this is the most interesting part, which is the actual configuration file for NANYML. So everything that you saw in code uh, within the snippet that I showed before, uh, that can actually also be used uh, or be configured here within the configuration file. Uh, we have a, a good chunk of documentation dedicated to this one as well. So you should be able to uh, figure all of it out, but let me quickly walk you through it. Uh, so you can see there's a couple of big sections here. Uh, the first uh, ones are all related to the actual data that we have. So the input data uh, definitions are going to be the reference data, analysis data, and optionally target data as well. It's not required, but in our case, because of demo purposes, obviously, we have it um, and we can use it. Now you can see that these are just like regular paths, uh, but you can see in the documentation uh, as well, that these might actually be S3 uh, locations. They could be Google Cloud storage locations, Azure Blob storage locations. And in that case, you can add credentials as well. So an access key and a secret, for example, in the case of S3, or if you have uh, them configured on your workstation, as most of you probably have using environment variables, et cetera, uh, then NanyML should normally pick those up as well, if you're running it locally, of course. Within a container, that's a different piece of work. So most of the time, you'll have to actually provide them there. Uh, but you might also do it using environment variables in the container. Uh, next up is the outputs. So in here, you can tell that we are uh, using a connection string to the database again. Uh, we're providing a model name as well. This is just for table generations uh, within the database itself. It's not uh, a requirement, but I'm just doing it because it's nice. Um, then we define what kind of problem we're trying to solve here. So this is a multi-class classification problem uh, It has to do with credit cards. We are going to chunk uh, on a daily basis. So I'll not go into details too much, but basically the chunking is um, going to control the way that your data gets grouped when uh, or, or aggregated when we're calculating the metrics, right? When we're evaluating metrics. Uh, and here we also define how uh, and where we would like our calculators that are fitted to be stored and then reused later, of course. Uh, and one of the most important things here is the actual column mapping. Normally when using NanyML within regular codes, you can just, um, you can just provide all of the columns that you need uh, in order to build a calculator or to initialize one. But in this case, because everything is uh, automatic, we actually need a full list of all of these things up front. Uh, and you can see here that we just define what the features are for a model. This might be a long list. Uh, we we're aware of that. Um, where uh, optionally what the timestamp column might be and then where we can find the predictions where we can find the model scores or the model outputs um, and this for every uh, one of the classes remember we're dealing with a multi-class model here multi-class classification and um, for each um, class within the uh, within the model we can find a column here uh, as well as the target values the target values uh, are always available within reference data as well. Now, that concludes all of the setup that we have. So then we can just uh, do the magical thing and basically just run Docker Compose up. You'll see a lot of output spewing by. So there we go. This is uh, Grafana booting up. It's quite verbose. We also have the database starting in the background. Uh, in a second, you'll see it. Uh, stopping right now. And then we can see NannyML firing up. Uh, so interesting to see is uh, it shows us that we're using a database writer. Uh, it could not find a fitted calculator in the store. So it's just gonna create a new one and fit it. So that's what's happening now. This is normally quite compute intensive, which is also why we try to skip it by uh, storing the calculator. And you can see that it has actually done that right now. So if we were to do a repeat run of this, um, you would actually see that um, NanyML will just 
use the pre-fitted calculator that has been stored within our local directory. Uh, you can see that the results of our calculations are being written into the database. Um, I'm afraid we won't have time to go through the whole thing uh, as well, but within the readme of the examples, you will be able to see all of the commands that you can use in order to connect to the database that we are also hosting as a container um, and um, explore the tables at your own leisure. Now, now that we've done that, we can see that NaniML has uh, successfully exited, so exited with code zero, indicating that everything ran as it should have. Uh, I'm not gonna shut this down yet because uh, let's quickly swap screens again and uh, go into our browser because now if we go to localhost 3000 and log in using NaniML, NaniML, and you can see that we are arriving at our uh, self-hosted um, Grafana. Um, and we actually have a couple of uh, demo dashboards prepared here. So this is, for example, a view of the uh, drift metrics that we have. So you can tell here we can select, well, in case we were to have like different models being stored within the metric store, we would be able to select them here. You can select uh, which columns that you want to see the, the um, drift scores for. You can select, uh, for example, a couple of different um, measurements uh, or methods that we use for the, uh, calculating the drift scores, etc. cetera. Uh, in our case, like Jensen Shannon is nice because it deals with both uh, continuous and categorical values. So in here, um, you can see that the values are um, fluctuating quite a bit. Uh, and as expected with uh, univariate uh, covariate shift testing, you can see that a lot of the time, like just they're not random, obviously, but um, like these one off uh, events occur where there's a, a little bit of a uh, of an alert going on. And this might occur, uh, but you can tell like in the end here, there is a significant increase uh, in drift score. Uh, and you would uh, ideally then use Grafana to set up the alerts to uh, trigger after, for example, like five consecutive uh, alerts occurring, right? Uh, and this could allow you to then uh, send a notification to, for example, Slack, et cetera, uh, and automate a workflow uh, based on this information. As a second part of the dashboard, uh, we also have performance. Again, this is uh, the same kind of information. So you can see here that the uh, realized performance, because we actually have target values, so it was calculated. You can see that the realized performance takes a serious uh, dip after a point in time, and that it's basically moving without uh, or uh, outside of the boundaries, uh, the thresholds that have been set during the reference period. Uh, and that is why we are also uh, getting alerts notifications here. Right. So this is the case uh, like where we calculate everything up front. Uh, that serves as a good introduction here. Uh, but let me quickly swap back over to uh, my other window. Here we go. Remove these things and let's go to a more interesting case. So this is the incremental case. Uh, and this is uh, a quite nice one because what it does is we basically simulate uh, running NaniML in a, uh, in a daily fashion. We have a data set that uh, consists of data for many days. Uh, and what we do is we split this information up and we're going to write it to file system. And we're going to do that uh, so that every day of data is put in a directory that corresponds with a single minute. It'll be clearer in a second uh, as soon as we run it. But basically, what it'll boil down to is we'll configure NaniML to look for a folder uh, that is that might have a variable name. So it's a templated uh, path. And uh, when doing that, 
every minute nanyml is going to run it's going to look for a specific location on the file system it's going to read the information that's listed in there and then it's going to crunch the numbers and it's going to add all of the metrics that it calculated for that given day uh, into the metrics database and that information is going to become available within Grafana as well. So we're basically simulating running NanyML once a day, uh, but here we're just speeding up that process to do it in a single minute every time. Um, I think the most interesting thing here is to have another peek at the uh, NanyML configuration file, because a couple of things have changed here. Uh, not that much, uh, but just a few small things. So in here, for example, the analysis data, you can tell now that this uh, analysis data now contains uh, a couple of um, parameter values, right? So template values. And when NanyML is running, it's going to dynamically fill in these values. And this will then basically form a path. And at this path, we are going to be looking for data. Now, why do we do this? Um, the main reason is um, like it's a very simple way uh, to deal with like variable input or deal with inputs that comes from another process. Uh, so you might have an ETL process that is configured to take the model inputs and outputs, crunch some numbers there, do some data preparation, and then write these files out into a fixed location, for example, once a day. And if you vary um, the name uh, and, and you make uh, the directory where they're written depending on the um, on the actual date that you're running the calculations on so that you can basically put all of these uh, info put all of these data files next to each other uh, then you can configure NanyML to basically adhere to this principle and use date information uh, in order to read the information to read the data for the inputs um, also important is that in here, we are going to ask NanyML to run in a scheduled fashion. So if you recall just a moment ago, when we were running NanyML, it actually stopped after a single run, right? It said status exited zero. So it ran successfully and then just shut down. So running NanyML in a repeated fashion, you might like, for example, if you put this on Kubernetes or something like it, you might schedule it using a cron job, for example, and just have that same container booting up, running once, and then exiting again. That's definitely a way to do it. But we also provide a way of uh, having some kind of scheduling built within NanyML itself, uh, and you can control it here. So in this case, we're going to um, select NanyML to run with a fixed interval, uh, and we're going to select to run it uh, once per minute. So it will wait for a minute after it executed and then execute again. Uh, another way of doing this is, uh, for example, using cron expressions. Uh, that works as well. Um, I do note that we are uh, running a different example here. So this is a regression uh, model that we're trying to run. Um, and we're going to try and predict what the price of a car uh, is. Simple case. Uh, and then if we do the same trick here, so we Docker Compose up. It's going to create all of the same things, but with one additional container called the incrementer. And the incrementer is going to just take care of uh, splitting up the data for us, um, as I mentioned, into this pattern where we can read it once uh, every minute. Now you can see a lot of stuff is going on here. Uh, and I think it might make sense for me to just filter out the logs as well. Uh, so in here, you can see that NanyML ran once. Uh, the run was successfully completed, and NanyML is now sleeping for a while. Uh, and I'll leave NanyML to it then. Uh, and in the meantime, in my other window, which I will share in a second, I am going to log in back uh, into Grafana. Which is now a different instance. And if you take a look here, then you can see that we have uh, a single, let's say, a single data point uh, because we've just calculated things for a single day. Um, and as we wait for a second, like at uh, 16, normally this second, yep. So NanyML has just kicked off again. 
it's crunched some numbers. And if we now refresh this, then you can see that we have uh, new values coming in here. And if we repeat this whole process um, on a daily basis, we will get a nice timeline out of this and I'm a nice time series with all of the relevant metrics uh, that we want to calculate for our uh, for any of our models. And this is basically like, this is a very simple uh, demo case that we have here, obviously, and there's a lot to expand on this as well. Um, but it's like a first glimpse at what it might be to use something like NannyML, for example, within a production case. Um, and we're actually still very interested in um, finding out uh, how people would like to integrate within their environments as well. Uh, and also like a quick plug here, we are also still looking for uh, design partners who are interested in uh, telling us more about their use cases so that we can learn more. Uh, and you can see like this is going to continue all the way through. Uh, and as soon as uh, we get somewhere in the middle, alerts are going to start popping up again. Uh, and then we can, again, use the built-in functionality for Grafana uh, currently to uh, notify us using the uh, built-in alert managing. All right, I'm quickly going to uh, fall back to the last part of the presentation then. I won't take long. Uh, I just listed some interesting and useful links here. Um, these all have to do more with setting up Grafa uh, with setting up NannyML in a production context. So a lot of it is about the configuration file, about persisting stuff, etc. Um, but if you're more interested in the data science side of it, also definitely go read the docs. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. As I mentioned, uh, the piece by Carter on which univariate drift to use, uh, which univariate drift uh, tests to use. Um, is a very interesting one, as well as the uh, rationale behind both of the estimation uh, algorithms that we have. Okay, um, and then like a quick conclusion, I always use the same one because it's always valid, I feel. Uh, so it's never too early to start monitoring, even if you don't have an advanced, uh, fully fledged monitoring system in place, just doing the like having a notebook running it once a month uh, is already enough to give you some insight. And some insight is definitely better than none because models do fail silently. Um, second conclusion, always try to collect your model inputs and outputs. Um, I know it's uh, managed solutions like SageMaker. There is actually a button that you can just, or a toggle that you can just flick and that should take care of it for you. Uh, in other cases when self-hosting, it might be a bit more convoluted to, to get that done. Uh, but again, we are very interested in hearing uh, what your setup is, how you tackle stuff, or what the issues are that you have surrounding this. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to helping out wherever we can with that. Uh, and then our third conclusion, and maybe the most important, use an IDML. Uh, I hope that I kind of convinced you that it's quite easy to set up, uh, quite easy to use, uh, and that there is some real value hidden within. Uh, so yeah, I hope you liked what you saw. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Mafalda. So uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you, Niels, for that amazing presentation. It was super fun to watch. Um, I just have one small note before we hand in uh, and over to the Q&A. So if you have any questions about the presentation to Niels about NennyML, uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A session right now. I saw that Zach had uh, the hand on sign. So please mm -hmm. make sure to uh, put the, your question in the Q&A. Uh, just one small or two small remarks. So as Niels mentioned, we're looking for design partners and this means that we want someone, we're looking for people to adopt Nanya Mail and to give us uh, information about what would be useful to them. And in exchange for that, we're gonna we give them uh, free open source onboarding. So it would be super useful for us to uh, for you to help us out. So if you're interested in that, please leave your contact information in the QR code in the left. And if not, it would also be super helpful for us just to provide us with some, some feedback about this webinar. If you liked it, if not uh, about the content, it's I promise it's a one minute uh, feedback form. So uh, please give us your opinion about it um, if you can. Otherwise, other ways to help Nanny ML is just to drop a star. Uh, 
on our GitHub page, um, which Niels has shared already. So thank you for that. Uh, just another small note is that we will have another webinar uh, coming next week. Uh, we will talk about how to estimate the performance of uh, machine learning models um, that are already deployed. And this will be with Wojtek, our co-founder, and the link to the sign up is also here. And there is a LinkedIn event. If you found us on LinkedIn, just drop us a message. And if you have any questions, just let, it, let us know and we will answer them um, shortly. Uh, so yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Neil. So this that was it sure. from my end. And um, yeah, I see uh, there are uh, not, no, no questions popping in. So Zach uh, maybe already dropped out. I think so, yeah. So uh, in that case, yeah, I think uh, we're good to go. So thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you, Niels, for presenting and helping us uh, figure out how to deploy an email. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Exactly. And uh, if you come up with questions afterwards, don't hesitate.